been a lead researcher at Carnegie Mellon as well for 20 years, is it? Right, roughly? And, okay, fair. and he has over 100 publications in the computer science field, which is just remarkable. So without further ado, we cannot wait to hear what you have to say. Dr. Jeff Schneider. Okay, great. Uh, it's awesome to be here where it's 75 degrees. It was not 75 degrees when I left this morning. Um, so, um, so I want to talk about a couple of things that are uh, connected, but otherwise quite a bit different sounding topics, self-driving cars and active optimization. Um, and so uh, this is the, the outline I'm going to go through. First, I'm just going to talk a little bit about brief history of vehicle autonomy. Uh, then I'm going to switch over to act, um, active optimization. At the end, I'll come back to what Uber's doing with self-driving cars. Um, uh, I, I probably have more material than I can get through anyway, so I'm just going to have to stop at some point, which means um, you should just ask me questions as they come up, and we'll just, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take the discussion where, where, uh, where it wants to go. And, uh, so, uh, so let me get started. A brief history of vehicle autonomy, and you'll notice very quickly this is a brief history as seen through the eyes of someone at CMU. Um, <laughs> the good news is <laughs> CMU did a lot of the early work, so it's not that far off a brief history of, uh, of autonomy. So, so in the 80s, this is uh, CMU Nav Lab, and the cool thing about this is um, it's that big because it has to be, right? <laughs> the computing that it needs to do anything uh, needs that much power and space and cooling in order to work, and of course this is the other glory days of robotics where you always keep the camera running just in case something good happens. And so this was the, this was the, the nav lab system. And so, you know, our, arguably this, uh, this came to some culmination uh, in the No Hands Across America project. And so uh, what that was is a drive, an autonomous drive from Pittsburgh to LA that was over 98% autonomous. Um, and it had one stretch of 70 miles with no intervention. It's kind of cool to think about that because that was, that was over 20 years ago. Uh, that, that this first vehicle drove, uh, drove across the U.S. like this. The other thing that's cool about it is this was back when these were called multi-layer perceptrons. So this was like the previous round of hype on neural networks uh, that we now call deep learning. Uh, and so, uh, okay, so what happened after that? So, so then CMU went off and got into other kinds of autonomous vehicles and went into um, off-road things. And the cool things here is that previous vehicle it had no idea what it was doing. There was really no smarts, right? It was just looking at a couple of lane markers and tried to stay pointing between them, but it had no idea what it was trying to do. Um, and so here, this particular vehicle, oops, I forgot to, uh, uh, this vehicle at least has waypoints from, in, a, in the sort of GPS point of uh, sense, it knows where it's trying to go. So it senses objects, doesn't do any reason, reasoning about them, uh, but it tries to find a path. Um, and in fact, when it gets a little bit in the open, it, it actually gets up to a pretty, pretty good speed. So uh, this was a real, a real step forward in, in, uh, in autonomous vehicles. This line of work, uh, of course, I think most people are familiar with the, with the DARPA Urban Challenge and the, and the other ones before that. And so this was a couple of good milestones as well because here we switch to a mode where the vehicle has good maps. It knows what it expects to see in the environment. So it's not only got a place to go, but it's got some references to work from on how to get there. It's primarily a LiDAR-based system, and of course the most important thing is CMU wins. Um, uh, I think in the, in, the, in the true sense of vehicle autonomy, probably the real most important thing was that that's the point at which Google said, hey, this, uh, this stuff looks like it's for real. Uh, let's start the, the Google Car Project, and it, and it started based on the based exactly on the technology and the architecture that was set up in that, in that particular challenge. Um, CMU also saw the opportunity, uh, and so this is, a, uh, this is a Caterpillar truck in a mine. And so this was, again, using pretty much the same strategy, Velodynes and radar and some good maps. Uh, the cool thing about this is one of the very early instances of an actually commercially available, completely autonomous vehicle. Um, and you can see that picture of it coming up onto a pickup. So the main goal here, as with others, is actually safety. This thing's so big that when you make a mistake, you probably smash that truck you saw in the, in the mm -hmm. picture there. Uh, so Caterpillar sold these around the mines. And so then what happened? Uh, 
uh, in January of 2015, that's when Uber started the Advanced Technology Center uh, in Pittsburgh. And they started it with a whole bunch of the people that did all those previous uh, autonomous vehicles that, that you saw there. And so you can see the sensor set here. Uh, it's very similar to the others. This is a whole ring of cameras. You have a LiDAR on top. Uh, it's got radar, GPS, IMUs. That, uh, uh, we just dumped everything on it. We thought it might need. Um, and so it's got a, it's got a good, good sensor set on it. And uh, without saying too much about it, the whole back of the trunk here is just stuff full of compute as well. So um, I like to, I'll just play this for a second. I, in this audience, I don't have to, but, but for other audiences, I, I find it entertaining to watch what would otherwise be a boring video. So this is very boring until you think you're the person that's got to sit down and write the software that's going to sort all this out, right? Because it's complete chaos. You've got people going everywhere, cars going everywhere. There's signs that matter that say stop on them. There's other signs like stop smoking on a billboard that doesn't matter. You should ignore that. The clouds, they don't matter. Ignore them. Unless they turn dark, then you might care about them. The trolley, you've got to watch out for. But don't worry about the rail on the top of it. It's just complete chaos. And it's... It's actually an interesting and challenging problem. And so um, what's also cool about this is that the, as a result, the automotive market is changing. And so um, I showed you Uber's car, but obviously we're not the only ones doing it. This is, even this is just a small subset of the, of the people who are doing this. Right? And so it's really uh, both a need and an opportunity to change what goes in a, in a car have lots more data, bandwidth, lower latencies, lots more computing power, um, less price sensitivity. What I find cool is that there's, a, and this is a sort of an Uber lesson, changing product specs. Safety and efficiency matter much less, much more than brand and style. Right? If you're going to buy a car and it's your car, oh, it's got to look good. And, but if somebody's just coming to pick you up in an Uber car, you, you don't care what it looks like. Just get me there safely. And so that, and that will actually change what the automotive market looks like. Um, but the change that's relevant for this talk is that this system is very, very complex. And so active learning and optimization of this system, on board, off board, never ending, this is just going to be part of the process. This is going to be part of how we engineer systems now, that there are these complex engineered. Uh, yeah, I hope during the talk we'll talk about safety requirements are actually specified in the lesson, but I, I notice in the opera the case there's probably negative safety that's, in, that's involved there uh, and in the industrial situation, commercial, on-road. Yeah, the, the, the things are much, much different there. When it, uh, it's jumping ahead a little bit, but just as a quick comment, we, are, we actually are, are getting statistics about how human drivers perform, and that ultimately will be the bar we're aiming at. Um, let me, uh, so let me just completely switch over. We've got a complex system, this is going to be hard, and what I'm going to do now is talk about active optimization and how that, how that might work to help us out. So for those of you that are not familiar with what active optimization is, uh, you may have heard it by other words, a lot of people refer to it as Bayesian optimization. Uh, I leave off the Bayesian because it, it doesn't need to be Bayesian, although it often is. Um, so what we have here is that there's an, there's an unknown black box function. This black function uh, that's, that's not known to us. The only thing we have is the ability to evaluate individual points one at a time uh, to get the value of that function. And those evaluations are going to be super expensive, so we can't afford to do a lot of them. And so the goal we have is how can we optimize this function? How can we find this value? while using as few of these expensive uh, experiments as possible. So that's the, the goal for active optimization. Now, wh where does that come up, right? So that, that, that goes by lots of, other, lots of other names. If you're a sort of classical statistician, you would call this design of experiments. Uh, if you're a Bayesian machine learner, you would call it Bayesian optimization instead of active optimization. It's also a similar algorithm to banded algorithms, uh, and it has other, other names as well. So what are, the, what are the cases where we would want to do this? Well, the classical ones are tuning the hyperparameters of supervised learning algorithms. And so if you've got to change the structure of your network or the learning rates of your network, 
And every single experiment means you have to train the whole network and wait to see what happens. That's an expensive experiment. Of course, things that require actual physical experiments are expensive too. Um, and there are lots of other things that are tested in, in simulation where the simulations themselves are, exper are expensive. So even though we do simulation to be quick and efficient, we still actually have way more simulations we would like to do to search a parameter space than we'll ever be able to run. So we need to decide which ones to run. So that's the framework. Um, how are we going to do this in this, this particular case? So this unknown function uh, will model this as a Gaussian process. And for those of you, don't worry about the math on this slide. For, for those of you that know Gaussian processes, it's the usual stuff. For those of you that don't know Gaussian processes, the only thing that matters is uh, it's a nonlinear uh, function approximator or a nonlinear regression algorithm that gives you not only predictions but, but confidence intervals, but po posterior distributions on your predictions. That's the only uh, relevant thing that matters here. Uh, so what does that mean? So, okay, we've got these red data points here on this function that we don't know. The black is the true function, but we, we don't know that. And so you, we'll model it with a Gaussian process, and what that means is we'll get a distribution of functions that might be. Uh, so all these are samples from the distribution that this function might be. You see they, they overlap where the data points are. And so that's what we'll do as we're, as we're doing our experimentation process. And then what we're going to do is define an acquisition function. So some function that is a function of all these, this distribution. And then what we're going to do is find the max of that. We do this just, um, we just do this in computation. This is, this is cheap to find this max. And then this would be the experiment we'll actually run. We'll run the expensive experiment at this point. And that's how it goes. So, so what, would be a, what would be an acquisition function here? I'll give you one just to, to give you the intuitive idea here. One acquisition function you could take would be to look at this sample of functions here and look at this upper confidence bound of this and make that your acquisition function. Now, why would that be a good idea to use that for your acquisition function? Well, because things that are high here these are ones where we estimate the function to be high, so we're trying to maximize this. But there are also places where our uncertainty about the function is high, so we know if we run an experiment there, we're, we're going to get some information by doing so. So this would be one, uh, one acquisition function we can use. Um, there are others. Uh, I list them here just by name, but don't worry about the details. You can do things like compute the ex, uh, expected amount of improvement you might get by running a certain experiment by looking at the posterior distribution. There are various kinds of sampling algorithms you can use to sample from these uh, and then maximize the sample. And then there are even optimal algorithms that hold in certain scenarios where your choices are, are independent from each other. Um, but I think you don't need to worry about these right now. You can just keep in your head the idea of this upper confidence bound algorithm. That'll be, that'll be good enough for the purposes of this talk. So this is it. This is the, this is the whole algorithm. What we're going to do is um, we'll use the Gaussian process to estimate f from the experiments we have so far. We'll create this acquisition function. We'll maximize the acquisition function. And then we'll run a new experiment at this point and add that to our data set and repeat. So that's the active, active optimization process we're going to do. Um, what, is that, what does that look like? So I can just sort of scroll through this in, in cartoon form here. So, so here, the black, we don't know it, no data points. This gray is our sort of confidence interval on what this function is when we start. We've got some prior on what that is. So, so when we start, we don't know anything. Uh, so maybe we just pick one in the middle. This is the acquisition function. It's black. Uh, we just pick one in the middle. OK, great. Uh, now we run the experiment, so we find out this value is here. That makes the acquisition function look like this. Right? So now we have this acquisition function. Uh, again, it's, these two are the same, but arbitrarily we'll pick that one, run the experiment there. So now we have this. We'll have a new acquisition function that looks like this. We'll get that experiment. And this process just repeats um, until 
we get to the end, and you'll see what's happened by the time we get to the end, that the right thing has happened. We've sort of covered this space, but we spent the bulk of our experiments on these places that look very promising to really hone in on the optimal. So this, this one in this, in this toy example, this has gone well, right? We spend our, our, our experiments well to find this missing. Okay, so, um, so that's fine. Okay, we draw 1D curves on a, on a slide, that's nice, but, but does this actually do anything useful? Um, and so, one of the things we have at CMU is we have this robot snake. Um, and so, you can see from the size of the steps, it's about this long, got 16 degrees of freedom. It is notoriously hard to control, right? Because all the kinematics, all the dynamics, everything is nonlinear. And, and in fact, a lot of the low motion depends on friction, which is an especially hard thing to model, right? So, so actually finding a motion of this that'll make the snake do something sensible is very hard. Um, and that's exactly what we're going to do. We are going to uh, come up with some parameterized gate. That's a bunch of sine waves running through it in space and time. And with just the very in order to um, learn how the snake locals better. And so it's basically that optimization thing. We're going to pick a and we're going to run the snake. So Physical experiments, it's expensive. Uh, see what it did, and add that in the room I showed you. So, what happens? Let me give you a few examples. So, uh, this is a snake, so it can, it sidewinds like a real snake does. It does all the other things a snake does. Uh, this is my wing ticket, as a human design controller. Uh, here is 40 experiments from the, from the organization. After 40 of these, it's able to do this, so it's able to find something that moves a lot faster. Here's one that's a little more difficult. This is the snake trying to climb up this ramp, and it's a short video because it, it's just going to do that all day. It's never going to get higher than right, right here on this ramp. And so, but after 40 experiments using just exactly that algorithm I showed you, uh, this is what it's figured out how to do. And it turns out the, the one of the secrets of this you'll see is that every so often it, it sort of flips over this way a little bit uh, so that it doesn't so it doesn't fall back down the ramp. That turns out to be something that's important for it to, for it to find. Uh, so those are fun, uh, but let's do some um, uh, something even more challenging. So this snake was built to do disaster recovery. So uh, earthquake or fire or something, there's a collapsed building. We need something to crawl through the rubble and look for survivors. And so a common thing that comes up in this is the snake arrives somewhere where there's an obstacle it has to get over. Um, and this is kind of hard because we can't get over this obstacle just with some parameterized set of sine waves. It's actually a choreographed sequence of motions it has to go through. Um, and so what we did was um, uh, we actually set this up at the Museum um, of Science and Industry in Chicago. We set up a master slave thing. So what happens is this is the, this is the master snake here and this is the slave. The person comes by. Uh, and bends the joints of this, and then this one makes the same bend in their joint. And it's a puzzle for them to try to get this snake over the, uh, over the obstacle. Of course, really what we were doing there is we just wanted to collect a lot of data so we could do a kind of principal components analysis and get some parameterized choreographed gates uh, that were, or not gates, choreographed motions that would get over this. Um, and so that's what we did. And then we ran uh, the active optimization algorithm on it. And let me show you what happened next. Uh, there's a couple of other tricks I didn't tell you about. So um, this, is, uh, this is the snake trying to get over this obstacle. This is uh, sped up 10x. So this is kind of the blooper reel, right? This is all the failures it had along the way. Uh, what we ultimately discovered is it was too hard to learn this high one right from the beginning. So we decided to make a simpler one so it could work on this one and then build its way up. And all we did is in the Gaussian process model, we just added an extra dimension for how high is the obstacle you're trying to climb over right now. Um, and then we just went ahead and we, we slowly made it uh, more challenging. Let me see if I can speed this up. Well, I'm probably going to have to cut this off earlier. It's too, it's too bad because it actually gets quite high by the end. But one of the things you'll see is that when it starts, it's just sort of doing this kind of motion to get over the to get over the obstacle. 
somewhere in the middle of this, it, it, it learns to do more like what's a Fosbury flop. It learns to, it learns to do this kind of motion back over, the, uh, back over the obstacle. And that turns out to be the, the key that it needs to get over higher obstacles. So let's let this thrasher out a little bit more. It's, uh, here we go. Yeah. So here's one of the things. So you can see what it what it actually looked like. It actually, it's actually quite smooth at the end. This one is. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go on, but it actually goes up one one more level. It's able to do one more higher than that. So so it's pretty cool. It's able to solve a uh, you know pretty challenging real robotics problem using that kind of active optimization. And, and I can assure you there was no way for a human to program that snake to get over that obstacle. That, that They spent a lot of time trying, even on much shorter obstacles. Was, was each trial in simulation, or was it an actual experiment? It was an actual experiment. There was actually no simulation in that at all. Um, we have a snake simulator. It just turns out it's, it's just not good enough. Whatever we learned in the simulation just mm -hmm. doesn't transfer. And so that was the... That was the issue. So finally, we just had to bail out and say, "Okay, we're we're doing it all in real stuff." How is the objective evaluated? Is it by a human? Uh, yeah. So this that particular one, uh, it's just a binary outcome. It's just you made it over the obstacle or not. Uh, which, going from a regression problem to a classification one, has some other uh, issues. But it's uh, it's in the papers that, that we wrote about these. Um, so you might look at that and say, "Okay, that's awesome. We we uh, got the snake to learn something." Cool, we're done. Active, active optimization, it works. Uh, there's one small detail, which is you can show theoretically, and it's true in practice, and it's not like it's any shock anyway, the number of experiments you need to optimize this, even with this efficient algorithm, grows exponentially with the dimension of the space that you're trying to optimize, right? That was the whole reason we had to go to the museum. We couldn't give it the full control space of the snake. We needed some examples uh, so that we could parameterize it back down to a low dimensional space in order to have a chance to, to search it. Um, and so, you know, in practice, the algorithms I just described to you um, even eight's a challenge. Uh, <laughs> it's much better if you can do like three or four. Uh, and so, there's really two key challenges. The statistical one is that you just need a lot of experiments to optimize in, in high dimensions. And the other is eventually you hit the computational one. Even optimizing the acquisition function becomes kind of expensive. And if, if that's not cheap relative to the real experiment, then you've got to do something else anyway. Um, and so people have looked at this. Uh, a common thing to do is to say, well, I know you gave me a high, di high dimensional space, but but actually, the real function is something simple within that space. And so there's a low dimensional manifold in there, and it's everything is uh, everything is actually quite simple. So you go to a two-step operation. First, you find this low dimensional space, and then you optimize in, in the low dimensional space. Um, there's a whole series of papers on that, which is great if that assumption holds. Uh, but if it doesn't, you're uh, you're not able to do much. And of course, the trendy thing to do recently is re replace the Gaussian process with deep networks. Um, everybody knows their magic, so good things will happen, right? <laughs> uh, and, uh, I mean, that's not, I'm not being sarcastic about that. It's, uh, it's a good idea. But there's, this, there's a very specific challenge in this case, which is active optimization algorithms depend on having not over, only an estimate of what the function is where you're thinking about doing an experiment, but knowing your uncertainty at that location. And so that's something that deep network still, it's, it's a struggle to get good measures of, of, of uncertainty. Um, and so that's still going on. We took a different tack. What we said is, what if we assume the function we're trying to optimize is an additive function? So you've got some original function, maybe it's, say, 10-dimensional. But we're going to break it down and say it's really uh, some small number of components where each one of these components is some lower dimension, some small d dimension. Um, and maybe if we have that structure, things will be, uh, it'll be more expressive than the other examples, but still possible to optimize. And so here's an example. So imagine you've got these 10 variables here that's your full space, uh, but it turns out that it's really the sum of three functions. One function of one, three, and nine, one of two, four, and eight, one of five, six, and 10, and it turns out seven is not And so we refer to this as the decomposition of it. 
And so the question is, if, if we knew the function had this form, could we actually optimize this 10-dimensional function in a reasonable amount of time? Um, and so what we're going to do then is we're going to assume now that each of these sub-functions can be modeled with a Gaussian process. And it turns out that if each of those is a Gaussian process, then the sum of them is also a Gaussian process. And it turns out that if your observations are just ob observations of the full function, you can still do all the inference. You can get all the estimates and all the uncertainties about each of the component functions. And uh, that's what this slide says. I'm not going to try to read through that with, uh, with you right now. But <laughs> all this says is that statement I, I made is, is holds true. You can do the inference in closed form. Um, but what does this mean for the active optimization algorithm I showed you? What it means is you can um, take this, say, here's a two-dimensional function. I don't know if you can see the contours here. But you can imagine it's only the sum of two one-dimensional functions. Um, and then what you do is say, okay, for my active optimization algorithm, what I'm going to do is model each of these. I'll do the inference on these. So now I have all my samples here. I'll make my acquisition function on each of the pieces. I'll, I'll separately optimize each of these pieces, and then I'll compose the results back together and do the experiment here, and I'll get the experiment result here. Um, and so that's the optimization algorithm that we do with the additive model. And it turns out, um, I'm going to, well, the only, this is just exactly what I just said. You optimize those pieces separately. And the cool thing is, it only takes, uh, it's only exponential in small d, the amount of time it takes you to optimize each of those, um, those smaller functions. And the sample complexity for, for optimizing this is also uh, exponential in small d. So. That's the good news. Um, the other thing I want to uh, I, I want to just comment on. It's very strange. I don't have time to show you all the results, but this algorithm does better than the naive algorithm of modeling the whole function, even when the structure of this is not additive. When I say does matter does better, by the way, that's a that's an empirical statement, not a theoretical one. <laughs> Previ the previous statements were theoretical. This one's an empirical one. And it kind of makes sense, right? You have a bias trade-off, uh, a bias variance trade-off. And so if you just model it as a simpler function, uh, it'll help you, at least in the, at least in the beginning. Um, yeah? When you're doing the Gaussian processes for these different tasks, whether it be the snake trying to get over, this, over the bump or, I don't know, a car driving somewhere, yeah. um, is it sensitive to the choice of the kernel that says, hey, which x is uh, are similar to which other x's, and how do you go about figuring out what yeah. kernels to use for these different tasks? A absolutely, choosing the kernel. The, uh, the kern it's not hard to get the kernel choice right. It's hard to get the, the bandwidth of the kernel right. Um, lots of people uh, maximize um, the marginal likelihood. I'm more a fan of, of, of trying to do more of a leave one out likelihood to do that. Uh, the real answer, I think, is to, uh, is to re-estimate it frequently. And on some iterations, your estimate will be bad, and you'll effectively get a random experiment thrown in there. But that's OK. As long as you get a pretty good kernel on a lot of the iterations, you'll still make good choices. That's what that, kind of what we said. Um, let's see. So we did some experiments here. This is a, this is a typical this is a simulation example. So we're trying to use a, a simulation of the Big Bang to estimate of the cosmological constants, like uh, like the Hubble constant, or how much dark matter, or how much dark energy there is. But the only way we can do this is to actually run us is to guess at values of these constants, run a simulation, and then check if the result looks like the universe we actually see out there. Um, and so we did something in 20 dimensions here. Uh, we went ahead and optimized this. Um, I'm not going to show you too many boring plots, but this is the likelihood of the best value it finds after 400 iterations. Uh, and these are a bunch of competing algorithms. This is random. This is the, uh, here's the don't decompose it, just model it as one large space. Uh, here's one of the random projection things I put in the references early. Um, and here's some of these additive models that are able to do better. Um, and 
And so we did some other things. So uh, for those of you who are in computer vision, you know the classical uh, Eola Jones face detector, a cascade of 22 weak uh, classifiers. So it's got 22 parameters here. Um, we optimized this. Um, and so each, each, uh, each test here takes about 30 or 40 seconds to retrain it and reevaluate it. Um, and so again, there's all these competitors. This is what it gives just out of the box. Uh, and here's the additive models uh, performing better after, after the same number of queries here. Um, okay, good. So how are we doing there? That's great. There's a couple of questions. How do you find this decomposition? I sort of said, suppose you know it. Well, of course you don't know it. Um, and you do the same thing. Basically, you sample. You, you can estimate it also, and you sample from the posterior. And the same thing happens. We've already proven you can't do a good job of estimating this, but the same thing happens. Sometimes you get a really bad estimate, and it gives you effectively a random experiment. And a lot of times you get a pretty good one, and you get a good experiment. Uh, if you want to know how to do uh, non-axis aligned models, there's a separate paper on that. Uh, and I want to talk to you about multi-fidelity optimization. Uh, so as we've assumed it so far, you've got some expensive experiment that you can't afford to do a lot of. Um, but in fact, lots of the time, we have a case where we could run cheap proxies for it. And those cheap proxies may, have, may give you biased evaluations or higher variance evaluations. But maybe because they're cheap, you can do a lot more of them and get to the answer faster. And so what's the model we put together? We said, here's a, just a two fidelity example. We said you've got a green fidelity that's expensive and a blue fidelity level that's much cheaper. And we assume it only deviates from the expensive one by this, by this bound here. And so what we do is we run the same uh, UCB algorithm. And what we do is for, for each alternative, so each, each one of these, we estimate a confidence bound given by the blue fidelity. Uh, I forgot which one was which now. <laughs> the blue is the cheap one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, uh, so the, the green fidelity, we do a regular confidence bound just like you would do from that upper confidence bound algorithm. Using the blue ones, we uh, at, estimate a confidence bound and add in this assumption about how much it could deviate from the one we're, the one we're really after. Uh, and then we can just take the minimum of these two to get, a, to get an upper confidence bound for the combined system. And then we run the same algorithm. You run the experiment that, that, that has the highest upper confidence bound, and you check the variance of, the, of your two estimates to make a decision about whether you will get information from the cheap experiment or whether you basically got all the information that's possible out of the cheap experiment and you have to do the expensive experiment. Um, we, uh, uh, there's some nice theoretical results there that shows that you, you can prove this scales uh, only in proportion of the ones that are indistinguishable at the lower fidelities. Uh, you can look up the, the theorems on that in, in the next paper there. Um, I'm super out of time, so I'm going to scroll through the experiments. But basically, we went through the same sets of experiments. And for the simulator, you get cheaper experiments by simulating on a coarse or a fine grid. Uh, and that's how you get your low fidelity or high fidelity ones. Uh, so we can do much faster. And now you, you, you count in CPU time. Right? You can run the cheap experiment. You don't have to pay so much CPU. Um, so I, I, I apologize. I'm going to have to skip all these. But we have a bunch of experiments on training classifiers, running simulations. Um, and in fact, uh, coming to archive soon is a, is a cont continuous value fidelity version of that. Um, I am going to gonna jump ahead again. <laughs> All these next few slides say is uh, we have a Bayesian optimization system like this that we use at Uber in to do the hyperparameter tuning for all our learned models uh, that we're using to drive our cars. Um, and so this is the architecture of that, but I think that's probably not the most exciting thing for you. Um, let me just scroll ahead and give you the, the summary on the active optimization part. Of it. And so the summary there is that now that we have a super complex system, we're going to start automating the optimization of that system, basically because humans are not that good at tuning high dimensional systems. Uh, it's the only way we're going to get this thing uh, working. We know that we need to scale this to high dimensions, and multi-fidelity algorithms will help as well. 
But there's actually a lot left to do in, in, in this area. The, one of the really annoying things is that in practice, when you go to optimize systems like this, what inevitably happens is you barely get started doing your optimization before you realize that two of the parameters you were using aren't having any effect on the experiment anyway, so you're wasting your time tuning those. But you just got an idea about three more that might have an impact and you try to add those in. So how you do that modeling where you've run experiments with all different variables, uh, that's quite a challenge. And of course, this gets to the uh, question you ask. There's a separate question of, okay, you can run this optimizer, but how do you know that it's gotten good enough that you could actually put this on a real car and put it on the road? So that's something we're still looking at. If you read, there's papers from Google and a few other places that talk about the, the dangers of having a whole pile of learned models in your system. Because every time you retrain one of the models, you change all the data distributions that the others are using because they're all stacked up on top of each other. It's kind of a very pessimistic outlook on the use of machine learning for, for especially for safety critical systems like this. Um, it's true, and you have to be smart about that. There's a couple ways you can be smart about it, but before talking about those ways, I don't believe that's any different than classical engineering. Anyone who's worked on a large engineering effort knows that you're working on your team and somebody somewhere else changed some other part of the system that had an impact on you and you didn't realize it and suddenly your part's not working again. It's really the, it, it's really the same problem, whether it's an embedded learning system or really a classically engineered system. One of the cool things, I don't have time to show you these videos, but one of the cool things about deep learning, those of you that are familiar with using deep learning to just do driving end to end is, that's the beauty of, of the backprop algorithm in deep learning, right? <laughs> you always train the whole thing end to end. So you never have a system where something in the middle was changed without correcting for its effects somewhere else. That's the whole point of the training algorithm. Uh, but nonetheless, I have a few videos on that, but that's not what I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna show you what's driving our cars out there today, uh, which is closer to that, that original engineered model. And so, um, uh, so this is, uh, in Pittsburgh in September, uh, Uber launched its uh, self-driving uh, service there. Uh, so these cars are all autonomous. Um, they're, they're not there yet safety-wise, so they have a safety driver with them. That, that, that person will take over if the car doesn't know what to do or it makes a mistake. Um, and the cars are pretty good, but you know, on any given trip, good chance they'll take over at some point. Um, so that was launched in September. This is... Uh, this is more promo video than anything with any content in it, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll play a little bit because it just because there's a couple things I want to show you that are fun. This is, uh, this is just driving around Pittsburgh. And at some point, um, right, so the rider is in here. You can see the rider asking for the destination. This little green thing, that's what means it's driving itself. Um, when we get back there, uh, you should see the display from that iPad with all the LiDAR scans on it. So the, the passenger in the back gets to see what the car thinks is out there. Uh, let's see, is this going to flash? I pretty fast. Oh, so are these using end-to-end -end neural network? No, these, these, these are not. This is more like the uh, system, classical. like the classical Google-style system. Right. Yeah. Oops, did I miss it? Did I miss the lighter sweeps? No, oh, here they are. Yeah, so this is what the passenger gets to see. Whoops, that, that was too fast, I think. <laughs> yeah. This is what the passenger gets to see when it's in the car. So you see all the lighter sweeps there, and there's a few indications that mark the objects it thinks it's uh, seen. So, so I encourage all of you to come to Pittsburgh and take a <laughs> ride in one of the cars and, uh, and see how they, how they operate. Um, of course, we have, uh, we've moved on from that. So, A, we've switched cars. This is, these are the new Volvos. Uh, the sensor set is pretty similar, still LiDAR here. This is still a bunch of cameras, uh, pretty much a, a, the same, um, same sensor set. Uh, and of course, uh, Uber launched in San Francisco uh, December 14th of last year, and immediately got, <laughs> got one of those from the, from the DMV. Right, so uh, that didn't go so well. Uber's, uh, Uber's quite aggressive about rolling out when they think the regulations are unfair, and so uh, 
But they are still using a card to create a data mine. Uh, we, we are again now. We, we weren't for a while. They actually pulled all the registrations on the vehicles. <laughs> like we, we couldn't even drive them with a person. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that's right. But, but they're, they're back now. That's, a, that, that, that's okay. Because I saw them on the road. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, you can see them on the road now. Yeah. I mean, we, not to get too far sidetracked, but it, it was kind of funny, right? Because Google was complying with a lot of regulations. But then Tesla was doing the same thing and not complying with any regulations. <laughs> and we said, well, they, Tesla, they let anybody drive. They don't even train their drivers. You know, why, why should we have to comply with that? But anyway, you guys, you guys know that story. That, was, that wasn't an enough headline. So, so what, what did Uber do? Well, so we moved to Phoenix, and we launched in Phoenix in uh, February 21st. So if you think Pittsburgh's too co cold to get a ride, go, go to Phoenix and get a, get a ride there. It's, it's not too cold. And, and of course now we're we're working with the DMV. We've got the permits back for the vehicles. If you're in San Francisco, you'll see them driving around doing data collection again. And so, at some point, uh, we'll take another whack at this and you'll get it right here. Um, I want to just comment a little bit. So it's not only the um, uh, it's not only the the cars and passengers that we're looking at. Uh, Uber's also looking at freight. And so. Um, this auto truck, this is doing a beer delivery. I mean, it's a demo, but it was. <laughs> there are 50,000 cans of Budweiser in the back. Uh, and they, uh, they drove 120 miles in Colorado uh, with no one, um, no one in the passenger seat. And so the, in, in this particular video, the, it's, a, it's a big semi, right? There's this like kind of sleeper area behind the seat. So there's a person back there with a laptop who's operating the system and just checking to make sure there isn't anything crazy going on. Yeah. Is that legal in Colorado? Uh, <laughs> I don't know about the general case, but what they did, you can't really see it here. They, they, they coordinated with the, with the state police in Colorado. They, they basically, they, they worked with them to pick the route, to pick the time of the day, and the police were, were monitoring it. So it was, it was a joint effort from the beginning. I don't actually know the broader details of what, what the regulatory uh, environment is. And so, uh, one question is, you know, how will this marketplace look uh, for, for autonomous vehicles? Well, there's lots of cool things, right? The good news is now we can control the supply. Right? So Uber, tries Uber, they Uber, they Uber tries to give them information and has financial incentives to try to match where the demand is, but they're not actually controlling anything. Uh, but once we have self-driving cars, we can directly control the supply. Uh, so that's great. Uh, of course, the bad news is we have to figure out how to do that. Um, and so that's a, that's a big opportunity in terms of uh, people that are into the operations research, the planning, that kind of thing. Um, there's a lot of other cool things to think about. Like Right now, the way the Uber system works, it's, it's probably, for most people, it's not a financial, financially better choice to never own a car and just take an Uber absolutely everywhere. It doesn't, it doesn't quite balance out. But if you take the driver out, it will. And so maybe individual car ownership, people just won't do it anymore uh, because it, it's, it, it's just too expensive compared to this. Um, that's also the case that the landscape of cities will change. We won't need all this parking infrastructure. This will be a, 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 a once in a you know generation chance to maybe redesign the city because we've got all this space that comes back. Another one will be with with public transit. So we do public transit schemes for the public good. It's good for our city, but financially they're actually not that very good that that good of deals. A lot of them, the city has to subsidize them heavily. Maybe once we've got more efficient methods of transportation. Maybe there will be different sorts of public transportation schemes that make more sense. Maybe a city should just pay Ubers <laughs> to take people everywhere at the same rate. Uh, it, sounds, it sounds stupid and a bit self-serving for Uber, but, um, but uh, high schools look at that already, that, that it's expensive to have all those school buses and it's cheaper just to use Ubers to get their, get their students there. Um, and even hospitals have done it to get their patients to the hospital. Um, looking further into the future, um, you know, this is a little bit more of the like science, fi science fiction sort of uh, crazy side, you know. If self-driving cars get substantially better than humans, way safer, I mean humans, n n 
too much is never enough for a person, right? If it's much, much safer, what are you going to say? Drive faster. Get more aggressive. Why, why are you so far behind that vehicle, right? <laughs> you can imagine that the cars start driving more and more aggressively because they can safely. And suddenly, the, the roads are no longer safe for a human to drive on. It's kind of like a, fun, it's a funny thing to think about, right? Maybe you have to go to the ranch to drive a car, the same places we go with horses now, right? We can't ride a horse on an expressway right now. Maybe, maybe human-driven cars are going to go the same way. I don't know. I think it's fun just to, just to no think about. Traffic signals anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Extended <laughs> And so uh, that, that's it. I already went over time, so uh, I'll, I'll just finish there. I, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions.